Hello, Storyline. My name is Pastor David Asherick, and it is an absolute privilege and pleasure to be with you. Um, we're going to be doing a series, a brand new series, but before I get into that, let me first of all just welcome everyone wherever you are, wherever you're meeting. I know we have a group in Eugene, Oregon. Hello, everybody, and also a group in Atlanta, wherever you are. Uh, a big shout out to you, but especially a shout out to those in Eugene, in Atlanta, and we are super thrilled about the way that God is using the Storyline uh, sermons and the church and the channel. And I was with you, oh, not too long ago, and we did a four-part series titled Rooted and Built Up. Now I'm going to be with you for a three-part series titled Life and Death. Life and Death. And we're going to go through three parts. And maybe I'll just say a, a few brief words ab about the series before we get right into it. The short version here is that, that I have always been a person, kind of, I think maybe everybody's this way, I don't know, I guess I've not had this conversation with a lot of people, but I've always been really fascinated by death, and to be totally honest, full disclosure here, quite afraid of it, especially as a young person. And I'm going to talk about the mystery of death, about grieving, about the gospel solution to death, and anyway, I've been reading books about it and thinking about it, and so over the course of this series, I'm going to be a little open, really honest, and probably even a little vulnerable with you, particularly in this first presentation. And uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this series. It's, it's going to be uh, reflections, I think honest reflections by somebody who is, in fact, I'm about ready to have a birthday coming up in, in just a, a few weeks, somebody who is past the midpoint of his life, who is reflecting increasingly on his own mortality. And so I don't know what age you are or what stage you are in life, but I am sure that you, like every other person probably who's ever lived, you have spent at least some time reflecting on the nature of life, the blessing and beauty of life, but also on the mystery of death. And so our series is going to be titled Life and Death. It'll be made up of three parts. And our first part today is titled, I am ready to be poured out. I am ready to be poured out. Now that's an unusual title. And some of you might be saying, I have no idea what that means. Others of you will say, ah, that's a biblical reference and I recognize it. So before we get into that biblical reference, which is found in 2 Timothy, I want to start by sort of talking a little bit more about my own childhood and uh, tell you a little bit about this person and uh, who this person is and who these people are. But just before we do that, let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the privilege of being here uh, on the, the Storyline YouTube channel, and I just feel so honored and so privileged to be a teacher of your word, and I pray, Father, that you will be with this series. You know it's one that I'm excited about, but also a little nervous about, Father, this is a difficult subject, and uh, it's difficult even within the context of being a believer in Jesus and, and knowing and understanding the gospel, and so, Father, I imagine there will be some tuning in that are unsure about Jesus, about his resurrection, about the gospel. And so I want to pray that you give me just that right amount of, of encouragement, but also confidence that we can just look to you, trust in you as we face what will happen to all of us at some point. And so, Father, as we confront our own mortality, uh, may we see in Scripture and may you infill us with your spirit so that we will have a better understanding of the times in which we're living and uh, how we can face the future, the uncertain future, unafraid. Now, this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I, I just quickly rifled through a few pictures there. Let me show you them again. I wonder if anyone out there, if I was sitting in a studio audience with you or if I was in a church, I would say, does anyone here know who this is? The only person here is the cameraman. Do you know who that is? No, the cameraman doesn't know. Uh, how about this one? you know who that is? No, no, he's young, so that's why he's not going to know. And I wonder if anybody here knows who that is. And the answer is, I don't know, I can't hear you. You don't know who that is, do you? Okay, so Michael doesn't know who any of these people are. Well, the first one that I put up there is a singer-songwriter, well-known singer-songwriter from the 60s and 70s. He's actually still around today, and his name is Gordon Lightfoot. Gordon Lightfoot. Now, why am I showing you these pictures? And I'll come back to the other two in just a moment. Well, the answer is, as I mentioned at the outset there, I have always been sort of I don't know if this is more or less than other people. I can only speak from my own experience and say that I've always been keenly aware of my own mortality and slightly afraid of death. I have over the years, like probably you have as well, had a number of people that were close to me, family members and even friends that died, and I'll tell you about some of them today. 
But, but I can remember early on, I was born in 1972, and in 1975, there was a, a, a freight liner, I don't know if freight liner is the right word, but a large ship, a freighter, that cra uh, actually sunk in Lake Superior. It was called the Edmund Fitzgerald. And Gordon Lightfoot wrote a song about this called The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And I can remember as a, as a young person, as I said, I was born in 72, the song was released in 75. I can remember throughout my childhood hearing this song and listening to the lyrics. And I remember one particular time, I couldn't have been very old, less than five, I was in my grandmother's bedroom and this song came on, her little nightstand radio, and I was listening to, I just sat there and listened to the song and I was so deeply moved. And, and all of a sudden, this incredible cloud of just sadness came over me. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald by Gordon Lightfoot. I would just say, if you're not familiar with it, listen to it. You can find it on YouTube, you can find it on one of the you know, music services. Listen, and if, if at all possible, have the lyrics open. And you will just, I think, get a sense. It's, it's incredible. It tells the story of the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald and the loss of every person that was on board. 29 people perished in that. And, and the way that, that Gordon Lightfoot tells the story, it's so moving and it's so sad. And I can remember as a child just being confronted what these people drowned. They drowned in the icy cold waters of Lake Superior. Let me just share with you some of the lyrics. It says, and this is when the storm is sort of coming up. This is about midway through the song. It says, when supper time came, the old cook came on deck saying, fellas, it's too rough to feed you. At 7 p.m., a main hatchway caved in. He said, fellas, it's been good to know you. I remember hearing that as a child and thinking, why? What's going to happen? The captain wired in. He had water coming in. The good ship and crew was in peril. And later that night, when his lights went out of sight, came the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Now, just a few verses later, Lightfoot says this, Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? I, I can remember, this is incredible, I can remember as a young child being haunted by that question. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? The searchers all say, the people that went out looking for the boat and finally determined that it had sunk, the searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay. And I have been to that very bay. In fact, I've been to the very place right near where the Edmund Fitzgerald sunk. And so the searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay if they'd put 15 more miles behind her. They might have split up or they might have capsized. They might have broke deep and taken water on. All that remains are the faces and the names of the wives and the sons and the daughters. And then this final verse here in this song. It's a much longer song than this. I'm just sharing with you some of the verses that made the deepest impact on me. Lightfoot writes, In a musty old hall in Detroit they prayed. I've been to this very place in the Maritime Sailors Cathedral. I used to live near Detroit and I went to this cathedral just so I could sort of see this place and, and hear the bell chime and just be. I, I've always been fascinated by this boat, the, the Edmund Fitzgerald. So he says, in a musty old hall in Detroit, they prayed in the Maritime Sailors Cathedral. The church bell chimed till it rang 29 times for each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald. One of the reasons that years ago I picked up the guitar and started learning how to play the guitar was so that I could learn this song and play this song. And it's just been a kind of a part of the furniture of my life ever since I was a young child. And it's always one of those songs that brings me face to face with death, with my own mortality and with the sort of temporality of life. Well, another song that had a very similar effect on me was written by this fellow here. His name is James Taylor, one of the best known singer songwriters from the late 60s and also 70s, uh, 1970s. And in, in 1970, he released a song called Fire and Rain. It's another song that I learned very soon after getting my first guitar. I wanted to be able to sing this song. I wanted to enter into the world of this song. And as with the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, I can remember the song Fire and Rain just being a part of the kind of landscape of my childhood. And here again, there's this face-to-face this -face confrontation with reality and mortality and with the, the temporary nature, the passing nature of life. Uh, this is what uh, he writes. He says, just yesterday morning, they let me know you were gone. Suzanne, the plans they made put an end to you. You're gone. What's happened is, and I, if I recall right, this was a, a friend 
of tailors that had committed suicide. I didn't know that at the time, but you could tell from the lyrics, somebody's died, somebody's gone now. I walked out this morning and I wrote down this song. I just can't remember who to send it to. And then this hauntingly beautiful chorus. I've seen fire and I've seen rain. I've seen sunny days that I thought would never end. I've seen lonely times, and we'll talk about loneliness today, when I could not find a friend, but I always thought I'd see you again. Anyone who has lost a family member or a friend, especially unexpectedly, you think, wow, I didn't think that was the last time I would ever see them. I, and, and it can be absolutely soul-crushingly lonely and, and devastating, and we are so disoriented by death, we don't know where to put it. We don't know what to do with it. The loneliness and the mystery of death. And that's exactly what Taylor's tapping into here. He says, man, I always thought I would see you again. And the second verse was one of my first introductions as a young person to the idea of Jesus, the person of Jesus. And again, the song was released in 1970. I was born in 1972. So I would have been very young. And yet this idea of Jesus who can help, Jesus who can be close, was sort of implanted in my mind, not really by preachers or Sunday school teachers, but actually by a song. And so listen to what the second verse says, won't you look down upon me, Jesus? You've got to help me make a stand. You've just got to see me through another day. My body's aching and my time is at hand and I won't make it any other way. That, that phrase especially, my time is at hand, hold on to that because we're going to come back to that in just a moment. So whether it's Gordon Lightfoot or James Taylor, I just can remember these as being significant songs in my own sort of development, my intellectual development, my, my moral development, thinking about the world around me. And yet each of these songs sort of confronted me with the, the temporary nature of life, the passing ethereal nature of life. One last song, and I put this group up, and I would imagine that many of you have no idea who this is. I actually gave this sermon recently. And uh, quite a few people, when I put up Gordon Lightfoot, some hands in the, yeah, yeah, I know who that is. And when I put up James Taylor, even more hands went up. But when I put these guys up, a uh, one guy, one guy knew who it was. And this is the sort of progressive rock band Kansas, also very popular in the 70s. And they wrote a song, actually a very beautiful song that, here again, was one of the first songs that I learned how to play on my own guitar. And the song is called Dust in the Wind. And Dust in the Wind has this very... Ecclesiastes type feel, right? This Solomonic feel. And I want to just read to you just a little bit of this. Dust in the wind, says the song. All we are is dust in the wind. Now don't hang on. Nothing lasts forever but the earth and sky. It slips away and all your money won't another minute buy. Now amazingly, two of the members of this band went on to become followers of Jesus, committed followers of Jesus, actually ended up quitting the band and writing Christian songs and pursuing uh, the arts as Christians. So quite fascinating. So I just start with this song from Gordon Lightfoot, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, and this song from James Taylor, Fire and Rain, and then this song, Dust in the Wind. Look at that. All your money won't another minute buy. It's all slipping away. The only thing that's permanent, they say, is the earth and the sky. We're just dust in the wind. Right? All is, all is vanity, said the author of Ecclesiastes. It's just all. Now, with that in mind, remember I told you to keep that little phrase in your mind there where he says, and my time is at hand, from the James Taylor song. My time is at hand. Well, I'm wondering if any of you have been to this place. If you're looking at that saying, I no, I don't know if I've been there. Maybe some of you have been there. This is a little church that's been built at a very important place in the south of Rome right, just to the, the southern part of the city of Rome, and this is called the Church of the Three Fountains. The Church of the Three Fountains. And this is the place, tradition says, and there's good reason to believe it, this is the place where the Apostle Paul died. Where the Apostle Paul didn't just die, where the Apostle Paul was executed. In fact, if you go in there, and I've actually gone in there and led a tour in there and sang beautiful songs inside, it's a beautiful little church, we like to go nice and early in the morning when the crowds aren't there. And this is a, a beautiful little spot. And you go in there and they actually have, if you can believe this, the very stone, an ancient executioner stone. And they say, this is the stone that Paul would have had his head chopped off on. Not just Paul, but many hundreds and thousands of people were executed at this place, of which Paul was one. 
right? The Roman Empire was a, a cruel empire, not an empire to cross, right? Not a state to get on the wrong side of. And every time, I've been there twice, every time I go to the Church of the Three Fountains, I just reflect on Paul and his work and his, his call and his mission and the person that he was. And I'm a, I'm a big lover of Paul's letters. I'm a big lover of his, of his adventures, his courage, his bravery. And I want to sort of bring you now to this line here. And this is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. And this is Paul reflecting, very likely in Rome. This is probably the last of the letters that Paul wrote. Okay? Probably the last letter that he wrote. And he's, he's sitting, no doubt, somewhere in Rome, perhaps even in house arrest or in a, in a prison. And he's writing a letter to his young pastoral understudy, Timothy. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, and he says these words, and you can almost feel through the text, through, through these centuries of time, that Paul is overcome with emotion here. You can feel that. I feel like I can sense that Paul knows, and very much like Taylor just saying a moment ago, my time has come. Look at what Paul says here. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Just, just feel that. Just feel what it's like to know that your life is coming to its end, right? I stand before you here today, 48 years old. I feel like I still have a lot of life ahead of me, but I have sat in many a hospital bed, and I have been with many people where they know because of a cancer or some other disease or just getting really old, they know I'm at the end here. Paul is saying, my time, the time of my departure is near it's at hand. He says, I have fought the good fight. A number of metaphors here. Paul loved to mix his metaphors. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He continues, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Now, we're going to go into this in greater detail throughout our whole series, but let me just share with you, I really like the way the contemporary English version renders a couple of these passages here. Now the time has come. Right? Again, very much like that line there in the James Taylor song, Fire and Rain. My time has come. There's this point at which all of us must come, not just face to face with the abstraction, the idea of our mortality. We will come face to face with our mortality. And so Paul says, for the time has come for me to die. My life is like a drink offering that is being poured out on the altar. I guess that's the last one there. So the same Paul that would come face to face with his own mortality is the Paul that would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And a little bit later in the series, we'll go, we'll go a little deeper on this passage. Not, not super deep because it's one of the most incredible, intricate, complex passages in all of the Pauline corpus. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you might have heard before, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is sometimes referred to as the love chapter. Well, I'd like to suggest that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 could be referred to as the death chapter. This is probably the passage in all of Paul's writing where he deals most intimately and, and most uh, deeply with the issue of death and what death means to each one of us and how death is remedied. We'll get to another passage in 1 Corinthians 15 in just a moment. But in verse 26, look at what Paul says. The last enemy to be de destroyed is death. So, so the same Paul that's writing to young Timothy and says, my time has come. I've run the race. I have, I have fought the good fight. And now I'm being poured out like, like an ancient drink offering being poured out on the altar in the sanctuary. I'm being poured out. That same Paul is the Paul who said, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Now, let's just talk a little bit about death from a biblical perspective, because perhaps, like me, you have heard people say really crazy-sounding things, nonsensical things. People will say, well, death is just a part of life, and death comes to us all. And, and yet, if you've ever lost a friend or a loved one, a brother or a sister, a family member, if you've ever lost someone, especially, and I want to emphasize this, in an untimely way, someone that was not expected to die, someone who died young, you never just sort of have this, you know, blithe resignation. Oh, yeah, 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 it's all a part of life. No. We feel devastated by death. We feel surprised by death. We feel attacked by death. Death feels to us like what? What does Paul say it is? Death feels like an enemy. 
And I love this passage here where Paul says, oh yeah, that enemy, that enemy of death, the enemy of life itself, it too will be destroyed. The teaching of Scripture, the universal teaching of Scripture, is that death is a foreigner, an enemy, an uninvited intruder, intruder into God's otherwise good world. When we, when we turn to Scripture and we find ourselves in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we have this beautiful picture of, of a good God with, with a good world, and He's placed Adam and Eve in, in a great relationship with one another, also with Him, and death is not there. But then in chapter 3 and beyond, death just shows up like an uninvited dinner guest and all of a sudden, death is confronting us and sin is confronting us. And every one of us has been confronted, faced with death of some kind, some kind in our life. Uh, this is a particularly uh, emotional subject for me. And I think I'll be able to get through this without crying. But the last time I did this, I really got very emotional and very teary because I have had two friends that have passed away in, in, in recent times, and they both passed away unexpectedly, one at 46, one at 53, and it was just absolutely devastating, devastating. I've also had two of my nephews uh, were killed in a car accident years ago. They were five and eight, killed unexpectedly in a car accident, just gone. And we've all faced death. We've all seen it. We've all been to those funerals. and. Again, it's one thing to go to the funeral of the person who lived to be 80 and 90. In fact, just like literally two or three days ago, I received word from uh, some of the church members that I pastored uh, the church in Australia that I was at for num a number of years. Uh, one of the dear saints in that church, one of the matriarchs of that church, in fact, Betty, uh, just passed away, and she would have been in her early to mid-90s, and her husband, Milton, passed away several years ago, and he was in his mid to late 90s as well. And uh, it just, it's like the closing of a chapter. It's the end of an era. In fact, one of my dear friends from, from Australia sent me a text just the other day, Nathan, and said, hey, I don't know if you heard or not, but my grandmother passed away. And yes, yes, even when people are in their 80s and 90s and beyond, when they pass away, it's still sad. But they, there's a particular sadness, right? A particular um, mysterious, we can't make peace with this sort of mysterious thing that happens when somebody dies out of time, prematurely, unexpectedly. And so C.S. Lewis, who had a lot to say about death, he wrote a really great book called A Grief Observed. His wife, as you may be aware, his wife Joy passed away of a terrible disease, cancer. And uh, he said this line, and I love this idea, and I want you just to feel this right now. Lewis says, the death of a beloved is an amputation. Whoa! That is an incredibly visceral way of thinking about death, right? Like, you think about your arm. If your arm was amputated, I actually had a good friend in, in high school who was pushing a car across a bridge, one of my dear friends, Brent, and a, a car was coming and didn't notice that, that the, the, what was happening, it was distracted, and slammed right into my friend Brent, crushed his legs, and he ended up having to have one of his legs amputated just below the knee. And uh, he was young. He would have been like 20 when this happened or 19 when this happened. And, and uh, he's really quite an inspirational person and went on to become a good rock climber. And he's it, it a wonderful guy. But the point was, his leg was gone. It just wasn't there anymore. And it's one thing to lose, like you say, oh, where's my wallet? Where's my keys, right? That happens to me on a daily basis. But what happens if you lose something that was a part of you, right? Like you used to have an arm and now you don't. You used to have a leg and now you don't. What Lewis is saying here is incredible. The death of someone you love is, is like that. It's like an amputation. It's like losing something that's a part of you. I've been reading a book recently that was uh, actually released in 2014 by Atul Gawande. Atul Gawande is a physician. He's a surgeon, Harvard graduate, excellent writer, by the way. He's written a number of books. But this book right here, I highly recommend. It's titled Being Mortal, illness, medicine, and what matters in the end. And, and he just talks about the nature of death and the nature of aging, not so much from a, a, a religious standpoint or a spiritual standpoint, though he does occasionally touch on those subjects, but just kind of like from a medical standpoint. What's it like to get old? We're all getting old. As my old friend who's now passed away, Richard O'Phil, used to say, we are all old age positive, right? You go in to get the COVID test maybe, and you might come back COVID negative, but if you go in to get the old age test, we're all old age positive. Every one of us is going to get older. And Atul Gawande in his book, Being Mortal, 
deals with this idea of our own mortality and of aging, and he does a great job of it. It's an excellent book, highly recommended. And uh, what he does is he intersperses the book with a number of stories about people aging and what it's like to age and the, the difficulties of aging and some of the triumphs of aging. And in one particular section that really moved me, especially as I reflected on that C.S. Lewis quote, the death of a beloved is like an amputation. He doesn't say it's like an amputation. He just says the death of a beloved, the death of a beloved is an amputation. Gawande is telling the story of one of the couples that he followed in writing this book, Bella and Felix. And they'd been married a number of years. As I recall, they were in their uh, mid to late 80s. And he was a physician. Felix was a physician. They'd been married, I think, like 60 plus years. And uh, I just want to share with you a little bit because it's going to really capture the same idea. It says they'd sat down to lunch. Bella turned to Felix and said, I don't feel well. Then she collapsed. An ambulance, whisk, an ambulance whisked her away to the local hospital. Felix didn't want to slow the medics down, so he let them go and followed after in his car. She died in the short time between, his, between her arrival and his. And, and this is really sad if you've been reading the book because you've gotten to know these people, and just, just like that, she died. It just, it just happens in the book. Now watch what Gowande goes on to say as he quotes Felix. When I saw him three months later, he was still despondent, still downcast, sad, depressed. Look at this language. I feel as if a part of my body is missing. Ah, what does that sound like? That sounds like Lewis. He continues, I feel as if I have been dismembered, he told me. His voice cracked and his eyes were rimmed red. Now, I don't know if Felix was familiar with the writings of Lewis and the idea that Lewis communicates here that death is like a, 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 an amputation, a dismemberment. I don't know. In some ways, I kind of think that maybe it's likely that he wasn't familiar with Lewis. While it's possible, it just I think that what Lewis and what Felix are both tapping into here is this idea that when someone that's close to you, someone that you love and someone that you've been loved by, when they... When they die, it's like a part of you has been cut off. I was texting back and forth with my good friend, Ty Gibson, who will be uh, no stranger to you here at Storyline. And one of my, I love so many things about Pastor Ty Gibson. He's a dear friend and a brother in Christ. And uh, Ty is a writer, and he's an incredible writer. I mean, he has literally sometimes sent me some text, text messages. And I'm like, did you just text this? He's like, yeah, yeah, just, just texting. I, are you copying and pasting from a book you're working on? No, no, I'm just texting. Because he writes some incredible things, not just in his books, which I absolutely love. But when we were texting about this very idea of death, this was a while back, I said, Ty, I'm, I'm reflecting on death, I'm thinking about death, I'm preparing a, a series of sermons on death. And uh, from a biblical perspective, we started talking about this very idea that Lewis says in A Grief Observed that death is like an amputation and in the course of that text conversation, just a text conversation, Ty sent me this. And I asked him if I could share it. So with his permission, I share it. He says, the point that emerges from this way of conceptualizing the death of someone you love, this way we're commenting here on the Lewis quote, we're discussing the Lewis quote, that death is like an amputation. So he says, man, the point that emerges from conceiving of death like that, right, as an amputation of someone that you love is that while they were alive, by virtue of the fact that you shared life together, you became integrated with them in a similar way to the way that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are integrated. Whoa. Which is to say relationally, right? The Father, the Son, the Spirit, all relationally, even ontologically interconnected. And so he says, that's what's going on here. Look at this. This is the text continuing. He says, so quite literally, when a beloved dies, a part of yourself is severed off and dies. Oh, oh. So it's not just that death is like an amputation. Death is an amputation. This is Lewis's point, and, and Ty's fleshing this out. Because you have shared memories, shared experiences, shared laughter, shared adventures, shared travel, shared whatever it might be, those memories that are bound up with you and with this person, when they're gone, those memories are at least some extension of those memories. Their memory of those things is gone. 
and the memories that you shared with them. It's, it's like you become the, the sole curator, the executor of those memories. It's incredible. He says, and that is why grief is an experience that stands alone in the human experience as utterly unique. Totally agree. Totally agree with this. It is not merely sadness. Thank you. Totally agree. Ty says, it is that the person who remains alive is sharing in the death of the one who died. Such is the mysterious intimacy of love. Whoa. Think through that for a moment here. When you are the one that remains alive, you share in the death of the one who passed. The Bible teaches that when someone dies, they go into a state that the Bible refers to as like a sleep, right? Like a sleep. And so the person that dies in some ways actually has it easier, right? Doesn't he or she because they die and that's it, right? They're in this state of suspended consciousness. The Bible refers to as like a sleep and at the resurrection, they'll be raised. And we'll get to that a little bit later in the series. But, but death is harder for those that remain. Death is hard. The, the death is shared the physical death is died by the person that is no longer biologically alive, but the death is shared by all of those that loved him or her. And I want to now be really open and honest with you about something that happened in my life. And I want to tell you about, I'm a, I'm a crazy fisherman, right? I love, I've, since I was very young, I've always been into fishing, especially fly fishing. And years ago, more than a decade ago, I met a wonderful person. His name was Martin, Martin Simpson. And uh, he was from New Zealand, and I was taking a trip to New Zealand, and New Zealand has some of the best fly fishing in the world. And so I was really excited to, you know, sample some of the fly fishing there and to take a little trip. And so our family went to New Zealand, and as it turns out, the pastor at the local church that I was going to be speaking at introduced me to Martin Simpson. And we, we hit it off immediately. He was a lover of God. I was a lover of God. He loved Scripture. I loved Scripture. He loved to argue. I loved to argue. He was a vegetarian. I was a vegetarian. He loved fishing. I loved fishing. I mean, we were just like, we were peas in a pot. We were about the same age. He was two years older than me. And we were both converts to Christ. I mean, we had so much in common. And it was one of those friendships where when you meet the person, it's like you, you were meant to meet them. They're like one of your like friend soulmates. And over the course of the next like 13 years, Martin and I would plan an annual trip to New Zealand. I'd go to New Zealand, I'd take a speaking appointment down there, I'd take vacation, and Violetta, my wife, was very generous, very gracious to let Martin and I uh, go, and Martin's wife, Penny, would, would they say, oh, you boys, go be boys, and we would just go out into the vast, beautiful, expansive New Zealand wilderness, some of the most, in fact, I would say the most beautiful country I've ever personally seen in the world, or at least in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, apologies to Australia. And we would just go wandering around these incredible mountains and valleys and rivers and lakes. And we would just for two weeks or sometimes two and a half weeks, just catch fish. And sometimes we'd catch really big fish like this 11 pound brown trout that I'm holding right here. This is a picture that Martin took. And uh, we were over the years featured on, I don't know, 10 or 10 covers or eight covers of, of Fish and Game, which is the premier New Zealand fishing magazine. He was a, a writer and a painter and a photographer, and it was just incredible. I mean, absolutely incredible, and we shared so much. We were both dads, and we both loved God, and we both loved scripture, and we both loved fishing, and so our time together was just a little foretaste of heaven. Well, Martin ended up getting prostate cancer at a young age, 44 years old, and through a series of complications associated with that, he passed away uh, just a few years ago. Uh, actually, five years ago, at the age of 46. And uh, just before he, pa he passed away in 2017, so not quite five years ago, before he passed away, uh, we took we, a, a trip, our last trip. Now, we didn't know it was our last trip. In fact, you can see right here, the last trip. And at the end of every one of our great fishing adventures, because we're pretty good at fishing, we catch a lot of big fish and take some really good photos, our, our adventures would always be published in Fish and Game. And uh, Martin would write it up, and I'd help him, and it was great. It was really cool when you have these sort of memories, uh, these recorded memories of your time together. And so we took this trip, and it was incredible, like the best trip we'd ever taken. We caught fish. I mean, I caught a brown trout that weighed 18 pounds, and we just, I caught another one that weighed 16 pounds. It was, anyway, I won't bore you with the details, because you get me talking about fishing, and I'm not going to shut up. You think I talk a long time about about scripture and preaching. You get me talking about fishing and it's just exactly the same. You put the two together, whoa, that's a recipe for a long time. 
So anyway, we ended up taking the trip, and it was amazing, absolutely phenomenal. It was two of my friends that went on that trip, not just Mark, but a dear friend of mine named David North, uh, who I just mentioned a moment ago. I had two close friends that died in a very short period together, one at 53, one at 46. It was two of them. Two of them passed away. Both Martin and David died in, in very short order. And in fact, Martin ended up dying first, and after Martin passed away, David and I were just devastated. And David had no idea that it would just be about six months later that he himself would die unexpectedly in his sleep. 53 years old, healthy. He was a cyclist. I was a cyclist. He went to sleep and didn't wake up. So this was the last trip. And, and Martin had actually started writing this before he got very sick and then eventually passed away. So I reached out to Fish and Game magazine about a year later. And I said, um, hey, Martin started writing that article. We've got great photos. It was an incredible trip. I'd like to write that article. And uh, they were like, yeah, yeah. I reached out to the editor. Yeah, please, please write it. And I said, it'll, it'll be a bit of a tribute to Martin as well, who was a frequent contributor to the magazine. And uh, so in order to do that, I reached out to Penny. This was uh, Martin's wife. And uh, she had sent me a bunch of his fishing gear and fishing clothes and rods and reels. And it was, I actually got that package. This is the true story. I got that package. She sent it from New Zealand. And it was so hard for me to imagine opening it up that it literally remained packed for about seven months. I just couldn't open it. I couldn't bring myself to open the package because I knew as soon as I opened it up, a flood of memories, a flood of tears, and I just wasn't ready for it yet. So I, anyway, I reached out to Penny and I said, hey, Penny, Martin was working on that last article. Could you send me, could you send me what he was working on? Now, you have to understand that Martin knew he was passing away. He knew, I shouldn't say that he knew that he was passing away. He knew that he was very sick. And he knew that the doctors were saying that now that the cancer had gotten into his bones, that he did not have a good chance of living. Uh, barring a miracle or, you know, an incredible spontaneous remission, Martin knew that this was the very end. Certainly, almost certainly his last fishing trip and maybe the end of his life. So Penny sent me the files where he had started writing this article that he was never able to finish. I reached out to them a year later and wrote the article myself. But in order to write that article, I went through the notes that Martin had written, getting ready to write this article. And as I was reading over this, it just, of course, again, as you might imagine, and I think I'm now finally at the place where I can sort of read through these things without just turning into a ball of tears, but, but I just want you to feel this idea of when you lose someone, the memories that were shared, the experiences that were shared, the intimacy, the connection that was shared, it's not like you're losing something else. It's like you're losing a part of yourself. It's an amputation. It's a dismemberment. And so look at this. This is in the unpublished manuscript. Martin Simpson says, The greatest thing I ever got from fishing was a wonderful friendship. Well, I might get a little teary. It's happening. Woo! The bond that exists between David and I is almost beyond words to describe. We shared incredible moments. We saw marvelous places. I mean, over the years, we spent months in the backcountry of New Zealand. We didn't know what was coming, exactly. We just reveled in the trip, each better than the last. And as we'd be getting down to the end of one of the trips, we'd say, what are we going to do next year? What watershed will we explore? What valley will we hike up? What, what's next year? And we, we thought we would be doing these trips until we were old men, until we were barely able, you know, with our canes and, and our walking sticks to just wind our way up these rivers, even if it was slow. We, used to, we, had, we had literally 20 years of trips all planned out. He said, we didn't know what was coming. We just reveled in the trip, each better than the last. And then he says here, each better than the last. He says, it all ends in death. All the joy, all the pleasure and wonder, all the memories lost forever like tears in rain. He was a great writer, by the way. And then this, such wonderful times are not meant to come to an end. We were built for relationships and enjoying life together. Exactly. When I was with Martin in the New Zealand backcountry, on many of those trips, it was just he and I. It's just the two of us. On a couple trips, like I mentioned, David came on one of the trips, and my good friend, Pastor Nathan Renner, came on one of the trips. But, but several of those trips was just Martin and I. Those memories are now almost gone. They're half gone. Because the memories were shared between he and I. We were the only two people there. And then now he's gone, and I feel like I'm the... And everybody will know this feeling that's lost a loved one, especially, again, in, in an untimely way. 
Or I suppose even if you've lost, say, a spouse after 50 or 60 years. I think of Betty, who, who was married for many years, decades to her husband. And then when, when he's gone, th those memories, you feel like you're the curator of those memories, the, the executor. You're in charge of those memories. And yet death just comes in like a bull in a china, sh china shop and just wrecks everything. Right? Death is this foreigner. It's, again, an enemy, an uninvited intruder, intruder into God's otherwise good world. And it's right at this point when we are confronted not so much with our own mortality, which we address differently, but the loss of another, that amputation, that dismemberment, that we could be tempted to just collapse into a heap of sadness and despair and loneliness and despondency. And it's right here that Scripture speaks to us, that Scripture speaks to us in our brokenness, in our hurt, in our heartache, the Apostle Paul, again, Paul writing this time to the church in Thessalonica in chapter 4, verse 13, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like the people who have no hope. I love this passage. Because notice that Paul, as he's writing to the church there in Thessalonica and people were hoping and anticipating that Messiah was coming, he said, no, nah, not quite yet. People are dying and they're saying, hey, Paul, why? What happened? You know, Uncle Marty died and, you know, Aunt Virginia died and all, our friends are dying. What, what's going on here? And I love this. Paul does not say, no, do not grieve. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say don't grieve, don't be in despondency, don't reflect with great sadness. What he says is do not grieve like those who have no hope. Okay, now this is awesome. Those of us who believe the gospel, we still grieve but we grieve in hope. Ah, this is, a, this is a paradox. To be simultaneously crushed with sadness and grief and despair. I remember, I just alluded briefly to the fact that two of my nephews, Christopher and Aiden, were killed in a car accident, ages five and eight. I'll never forget that phone call that I received from their father. When Danny called me, the, 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 the pain, he lost his two sons, his only two children, gone, gone in a moment. That doesn't leave you. You don't, just, you don't just one day wake up and say, oh yeah, my, my sons were killed in a car accident and I'm over it now. You're not over it. No, you're still grieving. But Danny and his beautiful wife, Darina, have learned to grieve in hope. Right? We believe the gospel and yes, we grieve. And Paul says, yes, grieve, but don't grieve like those who have no hope. Ellen White, in the incredible book, The Desire of Ages, which I've just finished rereading again for like the seventh time, says, not a sigh is breathed, not a pain is felt, not a grief pierces the soul. There, the grief that pierces the soul. And what grief pierces the soul more than the death of a loved one? But the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. God is bending down from the throne to hear our cries. Ah, this idea that we are not fully alone in death. That's what death does, is it makes us feel like we're alone in the world and in the universe, and if, if this can happen to them, then eventually it's going to happen to me, and, and you suddenly start to feel alone. You feel like, what is the purpose? What's going on in the world? And she says, yes, yes. Even when grief pierces the soul, God is bending from his throne to hear our cries. Friends, even with the Christian hope, the gospel hope, Facing a loved one's death is profoundly challenging. Without the hope that the gospel brings, it is impossibly difficult. And it's right on this point that I reached out to my good friend, Jennifer Schwerzer, uh, an author, a writer. Uh, she's just about ready to finish up her doctorate in counseling. And uh, amazing, one of the most amazing, wonderful people that I know. And I reached out to her and asked her about death and her reflections about it, just as I had with Ty. And she's a writer like Ty, and so sometimes the texts she sends are similarly insightful and amazing. And this is what she texted me. She says, the gospel, she's writing to me, David, the gospel actually enables us to feel our feelings. What? Blah, 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 blah. How so? Explain that, Jen, because I love that idea and I want to understand it. How does the gospel enable us to feel our feelings? For example, grief, she says. The pain of a loved one dying is too much to bear Without the hope of reunion in heaven, godless grief is bottomless. And I know this. I don't know it experientially because I'm a believer now, but I have, in the course of my ministry, had to do some funerals where either the person themselves was not a believer or if, if, 
the person that died was a believer, the family members were not believers. And when somebody who doesn't have the hope of the gospel confronts death, confronts the death of a, of a loved one, there is no bottom to the grief. You, you never get to the bottom and say, oh, so this, no, 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 no. She says, this kind of grief, godless grief, is bottomless. She continues, the despair drives us toward escapes and addictions or perhaps unconscious mechanisms such as suppression or dissociation. But hope in Jesus, I love this, makes it possible for us to face and fully experience the losses bound up in our human condition. Whoa! So in this way then, Scripture and the Gospel becomes really the, the gateway to realism. We alone can actually confront what's happening with death and, of course, by extension, what's not happening with death, which is the gospel hope. It's not the end end. It is an end, but it's not the end. I love this idea that Jen is teasing out here, that it's, it's an understanding of Scripture and of the gospel, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that really enables us to feel our own feelings and to confront this idea of our own mortality and the mortality of those that we love. Now just on this, and I'm going to kind of start trying to steer this down toward its landing strip here. In a letter that Ellen White wrote, just quoting Ellen White again, just a moment ago I quoted her from The Desire of Ages. She wrote this letter in 1899 and I've always been deeply impressed and moved by this idea that she unpacks here. And I want you to hear this. She says, the captain of our salvation, which is a great title, isn't it? The captain of our salvation was perfected through suffering. His soul was made an offering for sin. It was necessary for the awful darkness to gather about his soul because of the withdrawal of the Father's love and favor, describing here the experience of Gethsemane and the cross. For he was standing in the sinner's place, and this darkness every sinner must experience. The righteous one must suffer the condemnation and wrath of God, not in vindictiveness. Now watch this final slide here. For the heart of God yearned with greatest sorrow when his son was suffering the penalty of sin. Now this line. This sundering of the divine powers will never occur again throughout the eternal ages. This sundering of the divine powers? What, is, what does the word sundering mean? You've maybe been to a wedding where the old-fashioned language is used where, it, where they'll say, What God has joined, let not man put asunder. The word means to split to split, to drive apart, to put a wedge in so that it breaks apart into two pieces. What? Listen to that. This sundering, this splitting of the divine powers, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She says what happened there on the cross, the mysterious thing that happened there on the cross was like a splitting. It was like, well, how did Lewis say it? Like an amputation. It was like an amputation. You see, friends, here it is. Death is like an amputation for us. Because we are made in the image of God, and death was like an amputation for him. In the same, not in the identical way, but in an analogous way to the way that the Father's life was bound up with the Son, and the Son's with the Father's, and the Father's with the Spirit, and the Spirit's with the Father. In an analogous way, when our life is bound up with a spouse, with a family member, with a friend, with a loved one, with a son, with a daughter, with a father, with a mother, when they die... It's not just something adjacent to us. It's not just something that stands in juxtaposition to us. It's something that's a part of us is gone. It's an amputation. This sundering is something that is intrinsic to the very nature of death itself. And God experienced it. We're going to unpack that in greater detail in our series as we go forward. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, the author of Hebrews says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that he, by the grace of God, might taste death. Wow, what a fascinating phrase, that he might taste death for every person, that God might taste death. We're going to pick this up in our second session, but just, just ruminate on that over the course of this week. Think on that over the course of this week, that God might taste death. We all know, or most of us, the vast majority of us in the human experience know what death tastes like. It's a terrible taste. It's a taste that the moment it's, it's, it's in your mouth, you want it out of your mouth. You, you don't want to have anything to do with it. And yet God voluntarily, willingly, condescended to place himself ontologically in a position where he could die, where he could experience the suffering of death. 
so that he could taste death for everybody. You see, friends, God knows what death feels like. He sees us. He knows that pain, that grief, that sorrow, that despondency, the very kind of thing that I was experiencing, even as a young child when I would listen to those songs by Gordon Lightfoot or James Taylor or, or Kansas, all we are is dust in the wind. And, and uh, does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? And, and I always thought I'd see you again. As a, as, a, as a young person, I just could sense that, that death was big and it was inevitable and it was scary. I don't know if you have wrestled with the questions of death like I have. Years ago, I read a book, a fascinating book by a Presbyterian minister named Herbert Lockyer. And the book was titled, The Last Words of Sinners and Saints. And the entire book is literally just a compendium of literally hundreds, perhaps thousands of instances of what people said the moment they died, the last words. And I read that book and I, I had a, a, I wouldn't say a macabre fascination, but, but a, a mysterious fascination with wanting to know what it's like when someone dies. And now again, as a minister and as a pastor, and just frankly as a human being, I have sat at bedsides where people are in those final moments, getting ready to pass from this world into the sleep of death. You see, friends, death will always feel lonely, but the gospel assures us that even in death, we are not alone. Because at the center of the gospel, which we'll talk about in our next presentation, is that God experienced death, that there was a sundering, that he tasted death. Think about that. God knows what death tastes like, what it feels like. He knows that, that amputational grief that we feel in our hearts, that dismemberment. And so we close where we, we opened with this incredible line from Paul, where he's writing there to his young pastoral understudy, Timothy. And he says, Timothy, now the time has come for me to die. My life is like a drink offering being poured out on the altar. Death is lonely. But the teaching of Scripture is that we are not alone. We feel alone when a loved one passes away. And perhaps, I haven't yet experienced this, but even as we come quite close to our own death, I imagine there's a tremendous loneliness. But God has been there. He has experienced death and grief. Think of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, which we'll talk about in our next presentation. Think of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus weeping. This is not something that God is immune to, that he's aloof from or indifferent about. Scripture says he tasted death for every person. And so in our series, Life and Death, we, we begin by just orienting ourselves to the giant, dark, black, lonely mystery that is death. The good news we've just started to sort of creep up on, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the series where we will fully understand and embrace the good news of the gospel. It's been a pleasure being with you, Storyline, and I want to close with prayer. Father in heaven, we are mortal and we are just like dust in the wind, like a vapor, as the author of Ecclesiastes says. And Father, this can feel like a very lonely place and a dark place. And especially for those, and I want to pray a special prayer for those that are watching now who are in the midst of either having recently lost a loved one or looking at the prospect of losing a loved one, where death is imminent and disease is moving into its advanced stages. Father, as we wrestle with our own mortality, May we, every one of us that are listening now, come face to face with the fact that we need a Savior, not merely an advisor, not just a coach, not someone to, to give us some good counsel occasionally. We need to be saved, saved from sin and death. We know that we were not meant to die, that it doesn't feel natural. Death is an enemy. And so, Father, I pray that over the course of this series, that as we reflect on our own mortality, that we will be better prepared for our own death that will come at some point, but that we will be, even more importantly, better prepared to understand, to appreciate, and to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.